And yeah, I look at porn sometimes. Who doesn't? But don't tell my wife. She'd never understand. When I go on a date, I usually just order a salad. But the whole time, I'm thinking about the carton of ice cream I'm going to buy on my way home. My wife thinks I quit gambling. What she doesn't know is I lost her house payment this month. But my luck will turn around soon. I can feel it. Well, at all of our locations, I'd love to get you to participate. How many of you would be honest enough to say that at one point or another in your life, you were caught in a lie? How many of you would say, I've been caught in a lie? Raise your hands up. Go ahead and leave your hands up if you will. Look at those people that are not raising their hands right now and just say, you've been caught in a lie right now. When we sin, uh, it's so easy and so tempting to try to cover up with a lie. For example, recently I spoke at a large pastor's conference, and before I went, Amy said, can you not do that little routine about how, she, you know, where she's always like getting her hands all over and always wanting to make out? And she said, could you just not tell them that? And I said, okay, I'll, I, I won't. She said, you promise? I said, I promise I won't do that deal that I uh, often enjoy doing. And so I got there and just started talking. And I don't plan out everything that I'm going to say. I speak so often, I just kind of let it flow a lot of times. And I just happened to mention that we had six kids. And then just instinctively, I just said, and people always say, you know, why do you have six kids? And I said, well, it's just because my wife, Amy, she won't keep her hands off of me. And, you know, they kind of laughed like you did. And the thing is, people just don't believe me when I tell them that, but it's true. I mean, it honestly is true. That's why she doesn't like me talking about it. And I told them, they were laughing, and I just kind of lost control. And I said, it makes me feel cheap and used. I mean, I'm, I'm not just a piece of meat. I'm a person with a heart. I have feelings. And I, I do. I beg her all the time at night. I'm like, can we just cuddle tonight? I just want to talk and hold each other. But no, no. And so I kind of told them that. And then when I came home, she said, so... Did you talk about me at the conference? It's like, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. And she said, did you say anything about how I can't keep my hands off of you? And I thought I could be in trouble, so I immediately put on a mask. I have different masks I wear. This time I put on the mask that I call Innocent Craig. <laughs> huh? What do you mean? Did I talk? I didn't talk about you. She said, you never told him I can't keep my hands off you? like, uh, no, I don't think. I just, uh, who, me? And she said, then, why did I re read all these tweets from people saying that I can't keep my hands off you? She looked at you, me and she said, you are so busted. <laughs> then we made out to make up for the fight that we just had because that's kind of the way she is. So anyway, uh, when... <laughs> When, when you sin, you have one of two choices. The first one, if you're taking notes, is you are tempted to conceal your sins. When you sin, it's very tempting, and by nature, many of us, we try to cover up our sins because we feel bad about them. And you can see this over and over again just in the first few stories in the Bible. If you just look uh, at the early stories, you'll see a common thread. You'll see a sin followed by a cover-up, a sin followed by a cover-up, a sin followed by a cover-up. Start in the very beginning in Genesis in the Garden of Eden. God said to Adam and Eve, you can eat of any tree, but just don't eat from this one. The serpent came and said, did God really say don't eat from this one? And the serpent tempted Eve, and she took a bite of the forbidden fruit. She gave it to her husband. He took a bite. God came around, and they hid their sin, and God said, you know, why'd you do this? And Adam said it was her fault, and she said it was a serpent's fault, and the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> I just had this. It was there. And so I had to take it. And so there was sin and then hiding. Another story, very next story in the Bible, Cain and Abel, two brothers. Um, Cain is jealous because Abel's offering was accepted, and so Cain does the unthinkable. He murders his own brother. God shows up and says, where's your brother? Cain says, uh-huh. Uh, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? I don't know where he is. Sin, cover up. You see this in um, a story right after that. Uh, Joseph is a young guy. has a vision from God to be a great leader one day. He tells his brothers. His brothers are jealous. We don't like you and your cocky dreams. And so the brothers beat him up, 
threw him into a pit, and then sold him into slavery. And they're like, "Uh uh-oh, dad's going to be mad at us for this, so we got to come up with a story. So they took his coat, killed a goat, put the blood of the goat on the coat, and came into dad and said, we don't know where our brother is, but look at his coat covered in blood. He must have been killed by a wild animal. Sin, cover up. When we sin, we have two choices. We can conceal our sins, which is by nature what the easiest thing is to do. The second thing, though, if you're taking notes, is we can confess our sins. We can conceal them or we can confess them. Well, which is the right thing to do? The Bible says in Proverbs 28, verse 13, if I could get all of you at all of our locations to help me out, that would be great. The Bible says, he who conceals his sin does not what? He does not prosper. When you hide behind a mask and conceal your sin, you do not prosper. But the verse goes on to say, but whoever confesses and renounces his sin, what does he find? The Bible says he finds mercy. Whoever wears masks and conceals their sin, they do not prosper. The result is never good. But whoever has the courage to drop the mask, to confess and renounce their sins, they will find mercy mercy. If I could get all of you at all of our locations to say this aloud, could you say, smack it to me? me. Say it again, smack it to me. me. Just remember you asked for it because that's what I'm going to do. Today, many of you will stand at a crossroads. You will be confronted by your sin and you will have a choice to make. Continue to conceal it and not prosper, suffer more harm, or drop the mask, confess it, and find healing and mercy. The choice is yours, and it is a significant, life-changing choice. Today, you stand at a crossroads, confronted by your sin, and you have a choice to make. To help you make the right choice, what I want to do is tell you a story of uh, King David. It's found in the Old Testament. And what's interesting to me is King David uh, is a lot like a lot of you. He loved God. In fact, he was described as a man after God's own heart. So you have to understand, this wasn't just like a vile sinner guy. This was a very good man that happened to get tripped up by temptation, which proves to us that none of us are not vulnerable to temptation. 2 Samuel chapter 11, we'll look at five verses that will help tell the story. We'll start in verse 1, and Scripture says, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, okay, remember we're talking about King David, so he was supposed to be at war, but he wasn't, he stayed back. Uh, During that time, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army, but David remained in Jerusalem. Verse 2 says, one evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw, everybody say saw, he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. Now, is that a big deal? He saw a beautiful woman naked? Uh, Is that a big deal? Well, it's not the worst thing in the world if you just kind of see, oh, there's a woman and you look away. But that's not what he did. The Hebrew word that's translated as saw is the word ra'ah. And it means to look and to look intensely. So he didn't go, oh, there's a good-looking woman, bounce his eyes. Instead, he went, there is a very good-looking woman. And he started looking at her and looking at her and looking at her and looking at her and looking at her. Ra. It's pronounced this way. Ra. Okay. And so that's what he did. He saw this woman, and he looked lustfully. She was a beautiful woman. If you pick up the story in verse 3, David sent some messengers, someone to find out about her. And this guy came back and said, isn't this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? In other words, King David, respectfully, she's not yours. She's married. Verse 4, David didn't listen. He sent some messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. This whole tragic story is summarized in five verses. Sadly, for some of you, 
the tragedy of your sin that will cost you more than you could ever imagine could one day be summarized in just a few sentences. Well, dad, he, well, mom, she, well, my wife, she, well, this person I looked up to, he, in just a few verses. Because that's how sin works. It overtakes us, it takes us down, and then looking back, people are going to say, here's what happened in a few sentences, and a life is ripped apart. How did it happen? Just a few simple things. First of all, we'll notice that King David was not where he was supposed to be. When he wasn't where he was supposed to be, he saw something he wasn't supposed to see, which led him to do something he wasn't supposed to do, which cost him far more than he ever wanted to pay. The reason is because we are vulnerable to a type of sin that the Bible calls the lust of the flesh. There are different types of sin, but the lust of the flesh, those of you who are Christians, you'll know there's an ongoing battle in, in your life because you are now, as a Christian, spiritually connected to God. And on a good day, your spirit leads you and you do what is pleasing to God. But you also have this battle where your fleshly nature, your body, still craves its own selfish, sinful things. On a bad day, your body screams and overwhelms your spirit and silences your brain. And so you do stuff that you know is wrong, you know is potentially very dangerous, but you just can't help yourself because the lust of the flesh overwhelm the logic of the mind and the truth of the spirit. Those of you who are men, uh, maybe more than many women can relate to the sexual urges of the body just because of the way you're wired, where you get in a place and you think, logically, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't look, or I shouldn't think, or I shouldn't act, but the lust of the flesh just silence the mind and overwhelm it, and you do something later that you know was stupid and know wasn't worth it, but in the moment, you just couldn't control it because the lust of the flesh overwhelmed the logic of the mind. I remember the first time this happened to me. I was in the fifth grade, a little kid. I was over at my buddy's house. His name was Stephen, and he had come upon his dad's stash of Playboy magazines. And he said, you're not going to believe this, and, and he showed them to me. And to this day, I can remember two distinct things. Number one was Miss February 1977, okay? <laughs> now, you know, you kind of laugh, but that's the truth. If I work hard enough, I can bring up those images. That's how dangerous pornography is. It burns itself on the hard drive of the mind. The second thing I remember as I was flipping through the pages going, as I was flipping through the pages, I remember telling myself, my mom wouldn't like this. She'd be really mad. This is not good. You should stop this right now. Stop it. Don't look again. Don't turn another page. And what happened is the lust of the flesh overwhelmed the logic of my mind. If I'd been a believer then, it would have been the truth of the Spirit, and I did something very wrong. That's what happens sometimes, temptation. And the lust of the flesh is not just sexual, but it can be emotion that overwhelms the truth of the Spirit and the logic of the mind. It could be a a married lady who... uh, is kind of struggling in her marriage right now, and there's some other guy he's married to, but he's so nice, and, and he listens to her, and he makes her feel special, and old butthead at home is just bump on a log, and, he, and I know I shouldn't feel attracted to this married man, but oh, my emotions just make him so desirable. And so the emotions overwhelm the logic of the mind and the truth of the spirit and leads them into destructive Sin, lusts of the flesh. Uh, it could be something like overeating. You, you, know, you know you shouldn't eat so much. You come home and you feel like you're kind of depressed and you feel lonely and you're kind of sad. And all of a sudden, for some strange reason, this bag of chips comforts you. It's like, this makes me feel comfortable. And I should stop. Oh, but I feel so comforted. How do I eat the whole thing? The emotion overwhelms what you know is right and the truth of your spirit and you sin. It happens to almost all of us. It's the lust of the flesh at some time or the other. What do you do when you sin? By nature, especially in the sins of the lust of the flesh, we're tempted to conceal it. Who, me? I didn't do that because the lust of the flesh are very embarrassing. 
You have a choice to make. The tempting thing to do is going to be to conceal it, to cover it up. And that's what David did. He came up with his elaborate plan. Basically, plan A was bring Uriah, the husband, back off the battlefield so that he can get a little romantic with his wife Bathsheba, and then nine months later, he'll think it's my kid. So plan A, King David brought the husband back, and Uriah had too much integrity. He slept outside and said, I'm not going to go enjoy my wife when my men are out there uh, suffering in battle. So he went to plan B. Plan B is get Uriah drunk. Once he's drunk, surely he'll feel that good old loving feeling. Well, he got him drunk, and once again, Uriah had too much integrity, didn't do it. So plan C was send Uriah out to the front lines, and hopefully he'll be killed in battle. And sure enough, he was because sin always ends up costing more than we imagine. So what do you do? Lust of the flesh. Lust overwhelms the logic of the mind and the truth of the spirit. Oh my gosh, I don't want to get caught. Conceal. Plan A is delete the history on my computer. Delete the text to this person I shouldn't be talking to. Hide the wrappers of the candy I've been eating. Hide the bottles of the stuff I've been drinking or the pills I've been popping. Plan B is lie. wasn't me. It wasn't, I would never. Plan C, if you get caught, is deflect the guilt. Well, if you had of, then I wouldn't have to, and it's not really my fault. Ultimately, it's your fault anyway. Conceal, 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 all along forgetting that whoever conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. What happens when we try to conceal our sin? Here's what's amazing about God, is when we try to cover something up, God has an amazing way of uncovering. Look at what Jesus said. This is so powerful. A couple of verses. Luke 8, 17. Jesus said, For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed or uncovered, and nothing concealed that will not be brought out into the open. Numbers 32 in the, in the Old Testament, verse 23, says you may be sure that you're what? Everybody say it aloud. Your sins will find you out. Sin has a way of coming out. It ju- you may not get caught for a while, but sin just has a way of coming out. And if you're unlucky enough that it never comes out while you're on earth, the bottom line is you're going to know, God's going to know, and it's going to cost you far more than if you would do what is right. Here's the thing about God, is whatever we conceal, he has a way of bringing into the open. But here's a great thing, whatever we confess... He has a way of covering. When we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's the good news. God loves you enough that he brought some of you here today to confront you with your sin to give you a chance to confess. This is what God did with King David. In fact, I put in your notes uh, a chapter. I'd love for you to read this whole chapter. We don't have time to today. But it's 2 Samuel chapter 12, and it shows the love and the compassion that God had for David by sending Nathan, the prophet, to confront him. And and the very first verse says, the Lord sent Nathan to David. The Lord sent Nathan to David. Now, some of you may be saying, who in the world is Nathan? It's a new character. Well, Nathan is a prophet of God that God sent to confront Nathan of his sin, and Nathan, the prophet, said, David, sit down. I'm going to tell you a little story. Once upon a time, there were two men. One was filthy rich. He had so many lambs, you couldn't count them all. Everywhere you look, ma, ma, ma. There were lambs everywhere. There was another guy, he was a poor guy. Didn't have any money, didn't, didn't have, he had one little lamb, just a little one. It was a pet to him. His kids raised it. The lamb ate dinner with them, slept by them in their bed. It was a pet lamb. One rich guy with lambs everywhere, one poor guy with one little lamb. One day, David, this traveler came along and was hungry, so the rich guy didn't take any of his lambs to feed the traveler, but instead the rich guy took the poor guy's one little lamb, killed it, and gave it to the traveler. And David snapped. What? That's the worst thing I've ever heard. That's awful. This guy deserves to die. He should pay it back over and over and over again. I can't believe someone would do something that horrible. And Nathan the prophet looked at David the king and he said, you are that man. You are the one. 
You have sinned against God. You did the same thing, and it's time for you to come clean. The Lord sent Nathan to David because God loved him. And if I can say humbly, perhaps the Lord sent me to you today to tell you, time's up. You're the one. You're the person. It's time to do the right thing. Whoever conceals does not prosper. It's not good. Doesn't ever help. But whoever confesses and renounces finds mercy. What are you concealing? Let me just help you. Let me just help you. There are those of you here, you're, you are addicted to pornography and masturbation. You're addicted. You're addicted. Let me say this. Doesn't make you like the dirty, bad person that's just the worst person ever. What happens is Satan set a trap for you. And you stepped into the trap and boom, you got caught. And you need help. And the reason you're still addicted is because you haven't confessed to God and to his people and invited his ongoing healing process. Guess what? God loves you enough to bring you here today. There are others of you, you, you are committing the sin of adultery right now. You are, you are in a sinful relationship now. It's time to cut it off and do what's right. Others of you, you're flirting with it. I mean, you, you, know, you're, you, you know, you haven't done anything yet, but oh, you met an old boyfriend on Facebook who looked you up, or an old girlfriend, and you know, there's, the emotions are, oh, and I'm interested, and I'm thinking about, and something's going on inside you, and God loves you enough to confront you before you do more harm than you already have. The Lord sent the prophet to the people. There's some of you, it's, it's what's in a bottle. You, you, are, you are an alcoholic, and you need help. You're addicted to something in a bottle, a legal drug, an illegal drug. Some of you, you're fantasizing in your mind. Some of you, you're overspending. You're addicted to things and just trying to fill a void. And the emotions overrule the logic. We can't afford this, but the emotions say, but it'll make you happy, and it does for about two days. And then the emotions vanish, and you do it again and again and again. It's time to confess. Whoever conceals does not prosper, but whoever renounces and confesses finds mercy. And the good news is today, you are going to make the right decision. You are going to confess. And you're not going to confess halfway, because that's what many people do. Many people do a halfway confession. And I want to show you the fullness of confession. As Christians, there are two different places and people we confess to, and there are two distinctly different reasons. First of all, we confess to God. Now, why do we confess to God? If you're taking notes, we confess to God for forgiveness. We go to God for forgiveness. The Bible says if we confess our sins, it doesn't matter what it is, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's what many of you are going to do today. You're going to confess. I want to show you, a lot of people don't know this, but after David was caught uh, in his sin, he wrote Psalm 51. In fact, you might take out your Bible. If it doesn't say that in your Bible, you might just write it right above Psalm 51. Right after David got caught in his sin, this is what he wrote. And as you are being confronted by your sin, this may be exactly what you would pray to God today and this week and for weeks and months to come. Psalm 51 verse 1, David cries out, listen, listen to the repentance of his heart. Have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Some of you, that's going to be the cry of your heart. I've sinned against you, God, forgive me. Blot this out. He goes on to say, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I've been dirty. Make me clean. He says in verse 10, create in me a pure heart. My heart has been impure. I want it to be clean again. God, give me a clean heart, a pure heart, oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I want to be strong and never give in again. He says, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. I need you. I need to be with you. Then he prays, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. In other words, there was a time, God, when we were so close, but my sin has blocked our intimacy. Bring it back. 
I need your presence. I need your spirit. Don't take it away from me. Restore to me that, that intimacy that I once had. Some of you, there was a time when you were on fire for God. You, you could sense him with you. He was real and present to you. And now he's not. Why? Because for many, there is a sin that is blocking that intimacy. Wash it away, oh God. How did I let this happen? I feel so stupid. Created me a clean heart. I don't want it to happen again, God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me that I could please you. And all I do, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Confess to God. Let me tell you, that's the easy part. It really is. That's a partial confession. We confess to God and we also confess to people. The reason we confess to God is for forgiveness. The reason we confess to people, though, write this down, is for healing. It's for healing. We confess to God for forgiveness. We confess to people for healing. James said this. He said, therefore, confess your sins to whom? Everybody help me out. Confess your sins to each other, not to God, but to, each, to other people. And pray for each other, not so that you might be forgiven, but so that you might be healed. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you might be healed. Here's what happens whenever someone confesses a, uh, something to me. They'll say, Craig, I'm going to tell you something I never told anybody before. I think to myself, we're about to have a big breakthrough, and then their body language changes. They say, Craig, here's what I never told anybody. And they tell me, and there's this sense of just, just this relief. Why? Because for weeks, months, years, possibly decades, they've been carrying, carrying alone the burden of their sin. And when they share it and we carry each other's burdens, there's a sense of, it's finally out. I'm finally going to get help. It's no longer a secret. Now, some of you are going to say, well, I don't have to do that. Uh, I'm just, I'm just going to confess this to God. And I'm going to tell you right now, no, you need to do that. Because many of you, you're still trapped in your sin. And the reason you're trapped, you've prayed to God over and over and over again, but you've never let God's people in to help you heal. You need the body of Christ. That's what happens best often in a life group where, where we confess, here's what I'm needing, hold me accountable, pray for me. When I start to slide back, kick my tail, get in my face, encourage me, love me, build me back up. Don't stand between me and the sin that has overtaken me. And that's what happens. Some of you say, well, I, I don't want to do that because there's complications when you confess. Absolutely. I mean, no doubt about it. You confess some sin, there's complications, but I promise you they are not as great as the complications of concealed sin that continue to take you down. You will do the right thing and watch as God brings forgiveness and healing. One of my favorite stories in the history of our church around this subject. Years ago, I taught a very similar message. And there was this Sunday night, single adult life groups, mixed crowd, men and women. And this guy just, he, he was just eaten up with his sin. And he said, I got to just tell you, I am, uh, I'm very lustful in my thoughts. And I look at pornography. And he just, just blurted it out. And there was a girl there who was there for the first time. And she watched on thinking, they're going to kill him. I've seen it before. I see how religious people are. They're going to take him out. But instead, they just embraced him. Even the ladies there, they like were crying with him and praying for him. And it was like this holy moment of just another guy confessed, yeah, I struggle with this. Another girl said, I used to do this. And we're going to pray for you and we're going to see you healed. And she just watched on as there was this unconditional love around his confession of the lust of the flesh. What nobody there knew was she was a brand new believer, just gave her life to Christ, but still working as an exotic dancer. And she hadn't told anybody in her new Christian circle. And she watched as they opened up and, and embraced this guy, and she thought, maybe, just maybe, I can tell them, I've already prayed to God, but I'm still stuck. I'm going to take the risk and tell them. And through her tears, she said, I'm so embarrassed. I just gave my life to Christ, but I make a living as an exotic dancer. I do it because the money is good and I've got a little girl I'm trying to raise. I'm so afraid. And she just held her breath, just waiting for them to turn their backs on her. And guess what they did? They loved her and they accepted her. And then the guy who had struggled with, uh, with lust, he said, you know what? Because of what I, I want to make this right, if you quit your job, I'll help pay your bills. 
Another guy said, me too, man, I'm in. And then another girl said, yeah, you quit your job? Yeah, we're, and she's like, no way, you just met me. No, she said, we're the family of God, that's what we're going to do. You quit your job, we'll help pay your bills until you get a new job. And they just all started crying and worshiping. And the very next day, Monday, she walked into the, her place of employment. She said, I am a new believer in Christ Jesus. I cannot do this anymore. I quit. On Tuesday, one of the guys got her an interview at the place that he worked. On Wednesday, she was hired to work a new job. Now, to this day, what this woman does is she helps other girls escape an industry is, that is robbing them of their decency and, and humiliating them because Christ has forgiven and healed her. And that is what can happen when you quit playing the games and drop the masks, you stand at a crossroads today, and you've got a choice to make. Whoever conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces then finds mercy. God, I pray today that your people would have the courage to do what is right and pleasing to you. As you pray today at all of our locations, nobody looking around, go ahead and just kind of put your hands in your own lap right now. I don't want any, just, just kind of nobody looking around. And I, I don't know how to, I, I don't want to soften this, so I'm just going to go right to it. Those of you that know there's something in your, right, in, in your life that's not right and needs healing before God, would you just lift up your hands right now? Just lift them up right now. Lift them up right now. Praise God for you. Thank God in heaven for your honesty. Now, I'm going to ask it again because there are some of you that you're, you know your hand needs to go up right now, and it's not, and you're going to regret it. I'm going to ask you again. Others of you, you know there's something in your life that needs healing, and you want it healed. Would you lift up your hands right now? Lift them up now. Praise God for you, for your honesty. All of our campuses, God, I thank you for your love and your grace, that you care so much for us, God, that you would you would confront us with our sin to give us the chance to repent before our sin cost us even more. At all of our locations, as you're praying right now, here's what I want you to do. If that's you, I just want you to, in your thoughts, pray to God. Tell him what your sin is. Cry if you need to and, and just ask him to forgive you. You don't have to beg, just ask him. Tell him what it is and say, God, I've sinned against you. Here's what it is and ask for forgiveness. And as you're doing so right now, as a representative of God, I want to say to you, he is forgiving you. He is, he is putting your sin under the blood of his son, Jesus. He is casting it away from you into the sea of forgetfulness. He will not hold your sin against you. You are being forgiven. Now, God, I pray for those who will need to confess to someone. I pray that you would show them the right person or people. God, I pray they would have biblical community, that, that they, they don't, God, they would take that step into finding those other believers who would, who would help support them. I pray, God, for marriages. I pray, God, for friendships. I pray, God, for those who might be on the receiving end of a confession today. I pray that they would receive it with the same grace that's been given to them by you. God, if, if it's hurtful to hear something, I pray that they would see the love and the courage that it took to drop the mask and to say, I love you so much that I don't want to continue to hide. God, I know this, there can be many painful conversations and many complicated relationships, but I thank you, God, that those complications are far less than the complications of continued concealed sin. Thank you, God, for the forgiveness and the healing that you give us as we repent and confess. As you keep praying today, all of our locations, some of you, you're still under the weight of your own sin. You wonder, where do you stand with God? I, I can remember, man, I just know this so much. The way I grew up, I was so afraid. I've done so, I did so many bad things. I felt so guilty. I didn't know where I stood with God. So I, I tried to do religious things and stop doing bad things. And no matter how hard I tried, I still ended up doing the wrong thing. You see, I didn't understand the truth of the gospel that God loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus, who was born of a virgin, who in inherited no sin nature from another man, who lived a complete and sinless life, who became sin for us on the cross, shed his blood, died, and rose again so that, check this out, 
anyone, and that includes you, who calls on the name of the Lord would be saved. Anyone. Doesn't matter who you are or what you've done or how bad you've been. When you call on Jesus, your sins will be washed away. You become what the Bible calls a new creation. All that other stuff is old and everything becomes new. And that's why many of you are here today. God brought you here for this moment because he loves you. You're going to call on his name. You're going to be transformed. You will be new. Your sin will not be held against you anymore. It will be forgiven by God through his son Jesus. All of our locations, there are those of you who say, that's me. I know it. I need it. Jesus, take my life. I give it to you. Forgive me of my sin. Make me new. And he will at this moment. Those of you who would say, that's me. Count me in. I give my life to him. Lift your hands high right now. Now. Lift them up all over the place. Lift them up and leave them up. I want to look you in the eye. I want to see, see you right over there. God bless you and, and all, all of you right over here in this section. Praise God for you as well. Others, I want to see you. I want to look at you. Right back over here, praise God for you and both of you here together. Thank you, God. Right back over here in this section, God bless you. Others of you here in this middle section, ma'am, right back over there, right up here, sweetheart. God, God is making you a new creation. Others of you today, I want to see you. Right back over here in this middle section, way back here toward the back. Others, take my life. Save me, Jesus. Make me new. I surrender to you. Others of you, you're leaning into it. Step across the line. Take all of my life. Make me brand new. All of our locations together praying aloud. Everybody together pray. Heavenly Father, take my life. I am a sinner. I need a Savior. Jesus, save me. Make me new. Forgive me of all my sins. Because you died for me, I want to live for you. Fill me with your spirit so I could serve you for the rest of my life. Thank you for new life. I give you mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Life Church, would you take a moment? Would you worship God? Would you tell him thank you? Would you welcome those today born into God's family?